I'm your host, John Myers, live from Stillwater, Oklahoma. We have got a great show tonight. It's John Myers. Hey, everybody. Got to have my notes. It's John Myers from the Kicker Unmasked Studios. Got to have my notes. Alternator, alternator. Hey, everybody. Uh, you know, we have fun. You know, hit like and subscribe. You know, 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 right here, right now. It's John Myers. You know, you know, we like to give stuff away. Alternator, alternator. Post some more pictures. You know, you know, you know. We got to thank Steve and Becky live from Stillwater, Oklahoma. Don't forget Texas Roadhouse right here, right now. You know. Hey, everybody. Don't forget. Right here, right now. We have got a great show tonight. Hey, everybody. Had a great dinner tonight. It's John Myers. Right here, right now. Had a great dinner tonight. You know. So, uh. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. So, uh, housekeeping, housekeeping, had a great dinner tonight, so, uh, alternator, housekeeping, you know, you know, you know, housekeeping, so, uh, housekeeping, you know, from the Kicker Unmasked Studios, housekeeping, housekeeping, right here, right now, hey, everybody, so, uh, it's John Myers, It's John Myers from the Kicker Unmasked Studios. Hey, everybody, hey, everybody. From the Kicker Unmasked Studios. It's John Myers. Right here, right now. We have got a great show tonight. Hey, everybody. We have got a great show tonight. Uh, you know, you know. Uh, it's John Myers. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It is Tuesday night. Welcome to Unmasked Live here in the world headquarters of Kicker Car Audio. If you guys are just joining us here in for a heck of a show, but we had a good show last time. I got to thank Jacob and Carlos and Aaron for filling in while I was out. Those guys do a great job. And as always, we've got a great team here as well. I've got Steven behind the camera back here. We've got Ernie and Bill and JW back behind the scenes. So uh, we couldn't do it without these guys, nor can we do it without your support. So thank you for all you viewers. I mean, we got all the usuals up here I see on the board. I mean, we got... Baba, we got El Fuego, we've got just pretty much all the usual guys, and I'm sure Ashy's out there somewhere. Hope you get feeling better soon, Ashy. I know you're having a little bit of trouble with some health issues, but uh, hey, it, it's all going to get better. So, got a great show for you come up. We're going to talk what it takes to make an award-winning show vehicle. But if you're new to the show, don't forget, if you like what you see, hit like and subscribe and tell your friends, tell your neighbors, hey, you got to watch the show. They have a lot of fun. And yes, we give stuff away every time we're on the air. So if you go ahead and sign on to kicker.com slash UM weekly, uh, you can register for tonight's giveaways. We're going to cut the show off or the registration at about eight o'clock. So you get 27 minutes to register. First place winner is going to get a BF400 or BF100. That's our little Bluetooth uh, speaker that's battery operated. You're going to get an unmasked T-shirt and an unmasked koozie. Second place is going to get the, the TWS2. Those are our new wireless, true wireless in-ear earbuds, and those things sound great. And you guys are lucky that you can get them one of them on the show because you can't buy them right now because we sold out of 3,000 of them in about two weeks. Um, those things are awesome. I've got a set I travel with on the airplanes. They are great. So you're going to get a set of those. You're going to get the t-shirt and the koozie. And third place winner is also going to get prizes. You're going to get the kicker tumbler, the t-shirt, and the koozie. 
So we also want to let you guys know Andy will be doing Living Loud with Andy right after the show. And if you guys are not part of Kicker Club, I know just about everybody up there is, but in case you're not, sign on to Kicker Club and join 49 thousand plus viewers let's push that to 50 and uh, i think we'll send andy a cake when we get to 50 i just volunteered that guys hope you're ready for it so make sure you do that and if you have any suggestions for different shows let us know because we're going to do anything you want if you want go back and look at some of the past episodes we've been doing this about 136 episodes i think it is now so Look for us at a couple events coming up. We're going to be at the Man Show in Joplin, or not Joplin, in Springfield, Missouri. So that's going to be a real good event. That's anything that guys like. It's sports, it's electronics, it's barbecue, it's, it's tools, it's motorcycles, off-road vehicles, four-wheel drive trucks. So it's going to be a great event to go to, and that is this weekend, Friday and Saturday, in Springfield, Missouri. And also... Um, we've got a couple good SPL events coming up. If you guys want, go ahead and sign on to the Kicker Facebook page. Go over to where it says more, click the arrow down, look for events, and it's going to tell you all the events that are coming near you. And yes, in case you're wondering, the XRV will be making its way to Springfield, so that's going to be a lot of fun. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk to you about what it takes to build an award-winning show vehicle. We're going to go over three of the vehicles that two of them we have in the museum right now. One of them we'll have real soon. So let's take a quick break, and we'll come right back, and we'll start the show. Thanks, guys. Everybody, hopefully you got your soda, your coffee, or what, Red Bull, whatever it takes to keep you going for the next hour or so. So what does it really take to make an award-winning show vehicle? I hear this a lot when I go to car shows and go to events and people have a build book out or, you know, we put one out with one of the vehicles. We get so many comments that, hey, man, I really appreciate you putting this book out because my wife or my girlfriend or my significant other doesn't understand what it takes to do one of these. They don't understand why I'm out in the garage or on the shop for, you know, endless hours. Um, it really does take a lot of work, and these aren't just thrown together. So there's a lot of behind-the-scenes things that we want to talk about. And the first vehicle we're going to talk about is really cool because it's got three different stages in life, which will be pretty exciting. And we're going to have a special guest on here a little bit to talk about it as well. So, if Ernie, if you want to go ahead and pull up the laptop, we're going to start with not our first show vehicle, but this is uh, the 1999 Chevy Silverado that we did. Obviously, we uh, started this truck in about 1999. It was a cool build, and this is not the earliest picture of the truck. If I remember right, I think that truck was black when we got it. And this is actual paint. This is long before the days of wraps, so it has to go out to the body shop, and they keep it for six weeks or so, it seems like, to, to paint a brand new vehicle, which I never understood. But yeah, even the Kicker logo is painted on the side. So uh, we've got the lift kit on this truck. It got it painted, and I think that's Mark Eldridge hanging over the... Uh, the front fender over there doing something under the hood. But as we get going, you're gonna see a, a huge transformation on these vehicles and you know some really cool things. I'm gonna point out some of the, the more interesting things about the builds as we go. We, we've had a great team and I've enjoyed working with these guys on a lot of these vehicles and I do kind of miss being back in the bay, so I try to get out there whenever I can and roam around just to see what's going on. So, gotta have power. We always talk about power and batteries. And the top five silver boxes that you see up there, those are smart circuit breakers. Um, what they, we actually put these in. These were actually fairly, fairly new technology. Uh, when we put them in, they're called ICBs. So um, they, they really are 
better than just a simple you know, coil or a, a relay, but great little circuit breakers, and I think each one of those is capable of handling uh, 250 amps, the ICB250s. And uh, I wish we knew where those were. I think Mark Eldridge is looking for a couple of those. If you guys have any of those, let us know. Uh, you see a bank of four Optima batteries. What you probably don't see by this picture is where these batteries are mounted. When we first started designing the vehicle, we needed as much room as possible for the audio gear. So we built them into a box underneath the truck. So didn't need the spare tire. It wouldn't fit anyway. So we fabricated this box in in-house at the kicker fabrication area. Uh, we put those four batteries in. And the interesting thing, how do you think you mount four batteries and five circuit breakers uh, upside down under a truck? You build a platform and you build a lift to raise it up and that is bolted directly to the frame with U-bolts. So that is a serious, serious battery box and add a little bit of tail weight to the truck too, which kind of balanced it out with the engine weight on the front. But it's completely waterproof and bolted very solidly to the vehicle and anything you do in your vehicles, you gotta make sure they're safe. They're not, you know, something's not gonna fly off and hurt someone or it's not gonna you know, break and, and hurt you especially. So we spend a lot of time to make sure these vehicles are built extremely rugged and safe because we'll turn these vehicles loose to our reps and they'll drive them all over the country. So this is probably the meat and potatoes where you guys want to start. Um, obviously, we start by gutting the vehicle. We I think we already put the headliner back in at this point because we went ahead and did the, uh, the roof of the truck with, with Dynamat. But if you notice by the back window back there, there is a huge framework of four inch box steel. So this framework, it's kind of interesting. You can't really see the hole here, but there's about a three inch hole here that goes to the other side. This framework is bolted both the upper area and the lower area is bolted directly to the factory seat belt mounts. So you know that's going to be good and strong. So that's going to give us a nice firm foundation of where to mount the subwoofers. And most people ask, well, don't you normally mount subwoofers in an enclosure? Well, normally you do, but we decided to be a little different with this vehicle. And of course, like I say, you see a lot of sound treatment. Uh, you'll see a piece of PVC here in the floor that's going to have the power wires coming up from the batteries. Uh, got to have the wires coming in and it's got a good silicone seal to it so you can get water in the vehicle because that's another problem. People don't always think that, hey, if I cut a hole in the vehicle somewhere, um, water's going to get in. So yeah, even if you're not you know, in a flood, it just splashes and it'll find its way in. So that's where we start with a framework. And this is what that framework is going to support. That is four 15 inch L7 woofers that are going to be suspended by that box tubing frame and it's going to float in the center of the enclosure and the perimeter around this baffle for the woofers is going to be the port. So we did a lot of calculations to get the correct port area, the correct port length, and obviously the back is not in this enclosure. Those woofers were not played infinite baffle. But if you look at the paint job, it's all painted to be diamond plate. This truck was painted, and there was a lot of it to be painted, by a company called Ironworks that used to be in Sand Springs, Oklahoma. They're no longer there, but uh, when you see the paint job in this truck, remember that these guys did this truck in five days. I think there were 12 of them working about 18 hours a day to get this thing painted because it had to be ready for the SEMA show. There was no options, but everything you see is hand painted, it's airbrushed and clear coated and polished. So there is a ton of work. This is long before the days of wrapping vehicles. Uh, another view of the side panels. These are little quarter doors that fold out. Uh, put monitors in each of the doors. And right above that, you see the two trapezoid pieces. Those actually fit in the, the bottom of the doors. Those hold the capacitors. So we like to show off you know, a lot of different types of materials and products. So that actually house four 1.5 farad caps back when that was really a popular thing. Got to remember, 99, this was 25 years ago. So it was quite a while. So great look into the past at how things were done. So here's a, another section of that door panel, all painted, ready to go. And if you notice, that's not diamond plate. That's actually just paint, but uh, they painted it to look like rust. So great paint job on this thing. Like I say, it really was amazing. In fact, I got to say, it really still is. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the next phase. Very crazy door panels. That entire door panel, and I think Gary Biggs built that door panel, if I remember correct houses the kicker mid-base drivers and the kicker resolution six and a half coax and then mounted in component form. 
custom made door panel, but yes, that entire door panel is painted fiberglass. So there's a lot to paint there and polish and no flat surfaces. So it's not exactly easy to cut and polish without messing up the paint, but the guys did a fantastic job of that. Here's a console, and once again, I do believe this was some of Gary Biggs' work. Uh, if you're watching Gary, let us know for sure, but I'm pretty sure that was what you did. It's 25 years ago. It's hard to remember back that far. But kind of a neat little uh, addition, and that actually butts up to the dash. It actually comes out of the dash, looks like it's molded into the dash, and it, it really kind of is, with one of our KQ5s. That was a parametric five-band dual input uh, equalizer right in the bottom of the dash. The bed of the truck, and I'm going to enlarge this picture a little bit, was a little crazy. Um, they wanted a slew of amplifiers put in the bed of the truck, and as we're working on this, they said, hey, by the way, we want to be able to carry a motorcycle in there as well. What do you mean? You want to put nine amplifiers in the bed of the truck, and you want to put a motorcycle in the back? So that's when we came up with the idea to put the track in the center, and that is custom-bent quarter-inch diamond plate. And all those amplifiers are actually on little pedestals. And I learned something interesting about fiberglass doing this. If you mix that fiberglass too hot or you've got a really long span, as it cures, it will tend to warp things. So this was kind of, you know, the, basically the same size as the base of the amplifier, but it actually pulled this whole section down where there was about a half inch gap all the way around on the two ends of the amplifiers where that panel bent in the middle. So I had to go back in and fill all of those in, make sure it was all, you know, built to withstand the, the force of driving on the road. Um, you've got an eighth inch aluminum plate and then you've got a quarter inch of plexiglass. All those bases were lit up. So you see the bottom, this is also an LED, ple LED plexiglass ring that had strobe lights in it. So it was pretty cool. And yes, the entire bed of this truck is painted fiberglass. So. We got going, got it all, you know, dialed in. We started really finishing it out, and someone came up with the idea, hey, let's put a PlayStation in this truck. Where the heck are we going to put a PlayStation? We pretty much had the whole thing all fabricated, and you didn't really have a way to put one in front. So we ended up making these little pods for these monitors back before LCD monitors were really popular, and we sunk the controls down in the bed of the, or the, bed of the truck that's the actual player. And we got thinking about it, well, what fun are video games without sound? But we didn't have any place to really put speakers. So being the smart aleck that I am, I thought, hey, why don't we just, you know, get some more taillights and we'll mold them into the taillights and make them removable. So that's kind of what we did. We actually went and bought the taillight replacements from the Chevy dealership, put a set of rings on them, and then glassed the enclosure, and we made those so that they could be easily exchanged for the proper taillights so you could have the taillights when you're driving and you could have them set up as speakers when you want to play video games at events. So it was actually a lot of fun. Here's a view of the outside of the truck after it was painted. It was absolutely gorgeous. And once again, that entire truck is metallic. There's little ghost grills in there. Um, it just really is an incredible paint job. And yes, um, unfortunately, these vehicles can get damaged while they're out on the road. This was riding in our uh, earlier XRV trailer, not the one we currently have, and it came loose inside the truck and rubbed on the side of the truck for untold number of miles. Uh, and, you know, we were absolutely devastated because how in the world are you going to match the paint on this truck? So I called one of my buddies who I consider one of the best airbrush and best painters and fabricators in the world. We got him right here in Oklahoma. That's Eric French at Wicked Racing. He was able to touch up all the airbrushing on this truck to the point where no one could even see where it was repaired. So hats off to Eric. That was just an amazing job. But you got to be prepared for things like that. Uh, you know, if you uh, got a good painter, hang on to those guys. Don't make them angry because you might need to have something fixed later. But we had to have it done somewhere else because the Iron Cross at that point was out of business. But uh, we've known Eric for a while, and we turned him loose on this thing. He said, yeah, I can do that. We're like, great have at it. So he did a wonderful job fixing that. Here's another view of it. You see all the multi-layers. You see the sparkles, the rust. I mean, uh, and I believe this is the side. If you're on, Eric, I'm not sure if you are. I, I think you are possibly. But uh, I think this was the side that the whole back of the corner of the cab was damaged and the fender. But uh, just an amazing job touching that thing up. So here's a little quick view of the uh, taillight speakers that we were talking about before. 
Doesn't look like I'm going to be able to enlarge that anymore, but one of our old, you know, K-series component speakers sunk into the taillight, and they actually made it look like breaking out of the taillight lens. It was really cool. It was a neat truck, so it was just a lot of fun to be creative and have a couple different ideas. So, that was its first life. Here comes life number two. This was sold to, I think, uh, Mobile Concepts or, or Mobile Solutions. Uh, I think they were in Louisiana. They bought the truck from us. They were actually just one of our retailers, and they rebuilt the truck. They lowered it. So as you can see, it still has that same great paint job. Changed the wheels and tires and lowered it. Uh, changed up the enclosures a little bit. No longer do we have the 415s. We now have 912s and a bunch of coax speakers mounted on the side. Kept the same idea, put the monitor in the side, but completely changed the inside. Went back and put actual Chevy door panels back on it. So and that still has one of our mid-base drivers, I think from the size of that, I think that was the 8-inch mid-base driver with a pair of the SS, which I think these were released in 2003. The, uh, the uh, actually Sound Solutions, that's the name of, the, I can actually see their name down at the bottom of the door. But you've got the SS components both mounted as a coax and as a component. And here again, that nice painted fiberglass look. And you know, I don't think we see enough of that anymore. I don't know if that was just you know, a fad or if people don't want to spend the work, the time, the money. But I'd like to see more painted fiberglass because I think it really looks nice when it's done well. A little bit of a shot of the headliner and the overhead console. They say they changed every bit of this truck out on the inside. And the bed. Uh, took kind of a similar concept and rebuilt the entire bed with the SX amplifiers. Uh, great job on this, nice and clean. Once again, it's. I wish I would have had pictures of the bed lit up in the other, the other uh, uh, rendition of it. I guess I should say, but really nicely done on this vehicle. Whoop! Jumping ahead there, hit them too many times. And once again, they went back and changed the entire dash and the console. So they did a great work. Well, that was number two. Enter this year at SEMA. Um, we started talking with Travis maybe a year, year and a half ago, and he was talking about how he bought this truck. I think, it, think that's the way it worked, and he wanted to do a tribute to the Kicker Show vehicles. So we spent a lot of time talking to Travis on the phone. In fact, uh, why don't we get him on the phone? We've got him hanging out, don't we, guys? Let's welcome Travis to the show. There he is. How's it going? Can we hear you? You hear me? Yep, barely. Maybe I need to turn my uh, speaker up just a little bit farther so I can hear you. All right. So can you hear me? Us, now I can hear you. Wow, I guess I did have the volume turned down. So tell us how this whole concept started. What made you decide to do a kicker demo vehicle, and, and how did it all come to play? Uh, I remember that vehicle. You know, the local reps had it, and they would travel around to local uh, shops by us. And so I remember that truck when I was younger. Uh, and so when I, I've been in the stereo business a long time too. And so, uh, when I did have the opportunity to buy it, uh, I jumped on it right away just because I knew the history of that vehicle, uh, and the significance of that vehicle. Well, it, it absolutely looks gorgeous. I think you did the, the best job of all. And, you know, another thing that really stood out to me, and I was just blown away when I first saw this display. Tell us a little bit about this floor, because this is really cool. You guys know me and lighting. So tell us about the floor, Travis. Yeah, so that's a, a buddy of mine. Uh, he's big into the uh, Christmas lights. And so that's uh, a flooring that he makes that's completely programmable and you can program anything you want in it. You can see in that photo, it's got some words in it. Um, you can pretty much do anything you want with it. Uh, but he's been wanting to kind of jump into the car market as far as putting it in somebody's garage or you know whatever you may want to do with it. And so when we knew that we were taking this uh, to SEMA, I said, well, what better way to show it off than the SEMA show? Yeah, it was really, really attention getting. So as I scroll here through a couple of little pictures, I'm going to get let you tell all the details on it because obviously you know more than I do since you worked on it. 
and still the bed cover still looks face and that still is the original paint guys I'm gonna back up one with you know the exception that you know you, you painted the front where it was all chrome but the rest of that paint if I remember that's still completely original I don't think you had to do much that, other than you know buff it out did you yeah so that's all the original paint uh all we did was uh fix obviously like you said you know fix a few little spots here and there uh from the years of just it driving around uh and then we just re-clear coat it uh to just kind of preserve it and lock everything in but that's all original paint yeah it it looks like a million dollars and it only cost us thirty-two thousand when we had it done <laughs> so yeah you spend a lot of money on these vehicles but that was that time crunch like i say it had to be done in five days so to you know, airbrush the entire truck inside out, cut and polish it. Those guys work their butts off. So uh, tonneau cover, once again, it's got that, that awesome kicker K done in diamond plate. Um, you see the blue on the stripes down there looks gorgeous. So tell us a little bit what you did on the dash, because obviously the in inside has changed completely again. Yeah, so we uh, wrapped the entire dash uh, with vinyl uh, because it didn't really go with the look we were going for as far as color wise. So we toyed back and forth of painting it or wrapping it. And we decided to wrap it uh, because we went with your new uh, line of speakers. Uh, and so the stitching on those was the red. So we kind of went with the uh, black and red um, feature. And so we did the seats in the black and red. We did the red, uh, um, seat belts, and then we had the door panels uh, embroidered with uh, the red as well. Yeah, it looks absolutely gorgeous. Unfortunately, the picture is a little dark, but custom console as well with all the switches in it. A very nice, very clean work on the front. There's a better view of the door. And what did you end up putting for speakers in the doors? Uh, I think we, we ended up going with two of the uh, six and a half uh, coaxial components. And uh, those are in at the front part of the door. And then uh, those are all plexiglass with uh, um, holes drilled in it so that sound can come through. And then XK Glow, we teamed up with them and they uh, uh, hooked us up with a bunch of LEDs to put throughout the vehicle. So we just put LEDs everywhere. Awesome. Whoop! I, I hate this mouse pad, it's really touchy. <laughs> So let's talk about the bed. Look at that, uh, it keeps jumping. I gotta quit touching my computer getting near it. So looks like you got a lot of CXA amplifiers and looks like batteries, six of them down on the bottom. Yeah, so we went with the uh, Titan 8s and, uh, and then we have the amps above those. And then we have all the sponsor panels, again, backlit with uh, XK Glow's LEDs. And then um, we just did, kind of kept it simple uh we didn't want to go too over the top you know with the bed we just wanted to keep it nice and clean uh and so we wrapped everything with you know the beauty panels and just kept it nice and clean yep and it is it's absolutely gorgeous i can't wait for you guys to see this truck in person and the sub enclosure um how many subs we got in here was it 10 eight, 12 8 12s 8 12s yep once again, with the uh, L7S woofers and the grills, I mean, this thing looks gorgeous, guys. And uh, where, where are we going to see this truck next? Uh, Slamology. Slamology. And, and, yep, I'll be there for that one. And the usual uh, crew of knuckleheads will be with me from the, <laughs> the, the plant here. So we're going to have a good time and looking forward to hanging out with you since I missed you down at the Lone Star Throwdown. But uh, yes. headliner. Did the uh, Starlet oh. headliner. Yes, we did. And... Uh, Side note, we uh, didn't realize it at the time, but uh, after we got back from Lone Star, uh, we took top 100. That's awesome. Well, well deserved. I bet you were a lot higher than just the top 100. You had to have been in that top probably 5% because this thing is oh, yeah. gorgeous. I mean, and the, the fact that, that you know, it's original paint job from you know, pretty much 99 uh, that tells you how well this thing was taken care of, but it was used. I, how many miles has it got on it? Do you even remember? Yeah, so the truck itself has 56,000 original miles. Not bad for 99. No, it, it does have a, a new motor in it because uh, 
uh, we had to swap it out uh, after we did start building it for SEMA. Uh, because it hadn't been driven that much, the motor decided to let go. So we had to uh, pull that out and rebuild it. Yeah, I actually had a vehicle that had that happen too, just from you know not driving it enough. It never got hot enough to burn the moisture out. And eventually you had enough moisture just condensing in the engine that took out the... Uh, the you know, Oldsmobile 350 that I had in one of my old convertibles. So, but gorgeous, gorgeous truck. I, I just, I'm so honored by you know what you've done with this thing. Um, who's that? That looks like you, and looks like Steve. That is Steve. Yes. So it was nice to get you guys together for a picture. But you did something else that you know still to this day you know just really, really touches me. And I just, I want to tell you thank you again and. Steve's going to tell you, thank you. You had these custom jackets made. And I'll tell you what, um, you gave me, Steve, and Roger one. Um, I'm never going to wear mine because I don't want to get it dirty. I'm going to probably figure out a way to, you know, <laughs> encase it in a box and put it in my office for all to see because that is just really special. And that just shows the dedication that you had. And, you know, it, it was quite an honor to be a part of this. And uh, it's also an honor to consider you a friend now. So looking forward to Slamology. Well, I'm just happy that you guys wanted to uh, bring something back that I know you guys built back in the day. Uh, and I know we had talked about it kind of pre-COVID uh, and then COVID happened and kind of got put on the back burner for a while. Uh, but then, you know, we revisited it after COVID and uh, started it, you know, the talks again about doing it. Uh, so I was just happy you guys wanted to team up to do it um, and and kind of pay tribute to that truck because it is an iconic truck. It, it, it's really cool. And if you guys don't happen to catch it at uh, Slamology, uh, I think we've kind of worked out a deal, haven't we, tentatively to bring it back and put it in the museum for it six, is, eight, yep, ten months? Uh, you guys can keep it as long as you want. It will be coming back okay, at Slamology <laughs> bring to the, the museum. <laughs> yeah it, we'll have it on display so uh, i really appreciate everything you did and thank you so much for the dedication and the tribute um that really is humbling to, you know for people to do something like that and you know especially for me to work for a company and an owner that you know as great as we have so thanks to steve for making all this happen including this show so uh if you want to hang out we're going to go over two other vehicles that your uh, truck will probably accompany in the museum because these two yep. probably are not going to leave. So we'll, we'll dig deep into a couple other vehicles. All right. Uh, anybody got any questions for Travis, I guess? Let's go ahead and, and pop that on there. If anybody had any questions about the truck, I always forget to, to ask those things. So, all right. Eric Wadsworth says, how many hours went into it? All of them, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, so we worked on it uh, from basically a, a, a year and a half. That's basically it took us a year and a half to build. Uh, but, I mean, there was some some days where we were 14, 15 hours into it in one day, just back-to-back, -back, uh, getting it ready for SEMA show. So there's a lot we of hours not alone. in it. Yeah. That, all those take so many hours to, to put together and, you know, the – it, it's nice when the work pays off, but people don't really realize how much work goes into these things. And that's kind of where we're going to show you pictures of the, the other two vehicles. Two of the other vehicles we have in the museum, not all of them. We've got a, a heck of a museum. So, um, well, I think another thing is people don't realize it's not just one person. It's a team. You know, it's it takes a team of people to put these vehicles together. Uh, you know, you, you can't do it by yourself. Uh, if you did... Uh, hats off to you, but, uh, I did not, um, you know, I had a team and, you know, um, I thank them all the time for what they've accomplished, uh, for doing, uh, because it, it takes a lot of people to build a vehicle of this status. Well, it'd be nice someday when I get out your way to come meet all you guys and, and thank them. So that's pretty awesome. So do we have any other questions? I think Clint Black says, does the truck have an engine driving engine driven air compressor? Uh, no, it doesn't. So, and actually, is it on bags or hydraulics, or is that just? It is on. It, it's it's on air ride. We that's another. You know, you guys had it lowered. Well, it was lifted first, then it had a lowering kit, and then we took it to the new stage, which it lays frame on twenty fours, 
Uh, so we That's cut awesome. notch the frame. Uh, and so that was a lot of hours. Um, I got to give credit to uh, my guy, Nick, at Outcast Customs. He did all the framework and his guys over there. And uh, it's on a, a AccuWare setup. Um, and so, you know, it, it's the new version, I guess you'd call it. Yeah, you did a great job. So thank you very much again. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, uh, we're going to keep rolling. And by the way, the contest has ended for you guys. So hopefully you registered to win tonight. Uh, and if you didn't, tune in in two weeks. We'll do it again. So, Travis, thank you so much. And I'm definitely looking forward to seeing you at Slamology. But I'm sure I'm going to hear from you long before then if you don't hear from me first. So thanks oh, again yeah, for definitely. being with us tonight. And thanks again for all the work on that thing and, and letting the world see it. Thank you. Cool. All right there, Ernie. Pull on up my laptop if you want. We're going to move on to vehicle number two. So... This is a Ford Econoline pickup, and this was owned by uh, one of my good friends that lived about 30 miles away from here in a little town called Ripley, Rick Kirk. He's a huge Ford guy, and he was, kept talking about this Econoline pickup. He literally built this truck, took it to three shows over the course of you know a month or two, parked it in his barn, and it set for 28 years, if I remember right. I mean, from a completely finished show vehicle to just sitting in a barn for 28 years. So it's funny because when we pulled it out of the barn that was in, or it was actually in a garage, it kind of looked like a barn by that point, the way it was all overgrown, there was a perfectly preserved skeleton of a cat that was underneath it that passed away and, and biodegraded. So, yeah, that was not the most exciting thing. But, yeah, that tells you, you know, how long that was there. I mean, completely undisturbed skeleton. So in the bed of this truck, it had a 428 engine, and it was half in the bed, half in the cab, which was kind of unique. Those kind of lights did have an engine mounted, you know, in the back kind of between the, the, the driver and the passenger. But this is the radiator, and that radiator, it, it's hard to see up here, but it was hydraulically driven. So it, it wasn't electric fans, it was the hydraulic fans that were run off a, a pump from the motor. So it was really kind of cool. But um, obviously, you know, not a whole lot of customizing done in the bed other than stuffing that huge engine in there. Um, I think that was out of a 61 Thunderbird, if I remember. They had so many different things going on with this truck. It was actually pretty cool. So now we're going to go to uh, the next stage when we started working on it. And you, you heard me mention him once before, but we were so impressed with Eric did on, on that truck, we turned him loose on the Econoline. So after he did the Chevy, we said, hey, we got this Econoline pickup. Oh, and by the way, we want to make it center drive with suicide doors. So that's what every car audio you know, needs to start with, suicide doors and center drive. So once again, just trying to you know, be different and make a statement out there and I make the picture a little bit bigger. But a lot of work to take a vehicle that was not made for suicide doors. And this is long before those kits were available. Uh, Eric, we probably should have done Lambo doors on it. <laughs> we think about, hey, I bet we still can. We got the truck in the museum. But a lot of work went into this truck, a lot of body work. And uh, it still, to this day, looks absolutely gorgeous. Um, here it is in one of the stages. Uh, I can't remember how this went. Uh, I'm kind of losing track of time. You see Randy Botts and Sean Murphy and Dan Jobin and Jerry McCord. Jerry McCord is one of our engineers. He developed the very first Warhorse amplifier with help from another one of our engineers. So he was the, uh, the mastermind behind the original 10,000 watt Warhorse. But the odd thing is, I can't remember why, but the truck's all pretty much done, but you see a tailgate. They actually had the lines of a tailgate, and in its final form, it no longer had a tailgate. So I'm not sure, I can't remember if it came back for a while, and we decided, hey, let's go ahead and fill in the tailgate or how that worked. But you know, the inside, once again, we, as we mentioned, uh, we did center drive and suicide doors just to be different. So kind of crazy the way that all worked out. There goes that darn sensitive mouse. This is a 1998 Cobra R motor that we got from Ford. As you can see, it fit nicely in place of where that uh, 428 was. But that whole frame was custom built for that truck. It was made out of two inch by six inch square tubing uh, and built basically from 
front to back. So that was a lot of fun building a whole custom frame for this vehicle because it was not going to support what we did to it otherwise. So all those things you got to think about when you build, uh, you know, a high-end vehicle, you know, with the uh, the weight. And yeah, I I really complain about this mouse a lot, and I apologize, but yeah. Yeah, okay. Ernie, Ernie gave me a suggestion. Stop touching the mouse pad and just use the aerial keys. And that's probably a smarter thing to do. Uh, now you can see we've got the TCI transmission in place. We've opened up the little side pockets for the batteries and just a little storage compartment. Uh, we did have to open this up just a little bit to get the clearance for the motor in there. But you see some uh, the vacuum canister sitting here for a couple other applications. But it's starting to take mechanical shape. And there in the center of that picture, you see the Vortex supercharger. So it wasn't enough that we had a you know Cobra R engine in the thing. We had to supercharge it too. If you're going to do it, do it all out. I think Travis will agree with that. I mean, it, it gets to the point where it's about the final product, not what you know it costs to do it in the meantime. I don't know if we ever kept track of exactly what these vehicles cost putting them together, but you know it's not cheap. But you know that's why it's nice to show them off and have someone uh, see it and be you know thrilled by it. Uh, you guys have probably all seen typical headers. Well, these were custom built. Headers. It took two months to build the headers for this truck. Um, I don't know if the guy was just that slow or what, but yeah, it was kind of a, a process. But they definitely had to have custom headers the way this thing, the engine was mounted and the way it was set in the vehicle because that motor is not meant to be mounted, you know, midship in any type vehicle. The rear end, obviously, that uh, Ford Econoline rear end would not hold the horsepower, that supercharged engine. So that is the rear suspension out of a 97 Lincoln Mark 8. So it already had the airbags, it was already independent rear suspension, already had the disc brakes on it. So that bolted right up to the frame. And then here's the start of some of the audio system. Uh, up in the headliner, uh, we decided we we're going to mount some, we've got to put amplifiers everywhere. We want to do this thing over the top. And here you see the, uh, the cardboard form once those were uh, put in place. We had a nice support. We could mount the amplifiers, and you could see that the metal bars welded in all over to support the weight of those amplifiers, because you definitely don't want the amplifiers dropping on your head. And that's the start of the trim panel, the headliner that's going to go basically behind the amplifiers. And here's the mounting plates. So yeah, it looks like five amplifiers, but in reality, there's three amplifiers and two of our 30-band uh, equalizers, the KQ30s were mounted, one for the left channel and one for the right channel, and then, you know, three SX amplifiers mounted in the top. You got to have controls, so we made this nice little overhead pod, which set basically where the visor should be, uh, that held the Clarion uh, CD player, and it also held a Clarion DVD player, back when Clarion was a player in the audio market, and spent a lot of time fabricating this panel and here's the panel that holds the amplifiers that's painted to match the vehicle. Once again, Eric sprayed a lot of blue paint on these that houses the KQ30s and the three SX amplifiers. Now, even though we know this is a show vehicle, if you are going to drive it, you know, you want some comfort. So, of course, vintage air. We had to put, you know, heating and air conditioning in the vehicle. And once again, you see lots of Dynamat in this vehicle. It's several layers and a lot of it. And here's a great shot of Toby and Sean working on the gauges. And these were all classic instrument gauges, and they have the Kicker logo silkscreen in the face of every one of those gauges that we had those custom built for the vehicles. And as you guys know, some of that stuff is not cheap to do, but it's just those little touches that put these vehicles over the top. So here's the dash in place, and you see the mock-up of the, the mid-ranges and the mid-base underneath the gauges. Um, but if you'll see in the final picture, uh, these 8-inch uh, woofers in the bottom never made it to the final production. Once we put them in the vehicle and kind of looked, you know, getting in and out, they were a little obtrusive, you know, kind of, you know, were blocking you from getting in and out of the vehicle smoothly. So you do have to be ready to change your thought process, you know, midstream in these vehicles. Uh, I had somebody ask me one time, do all these vehicles end up looking exactly the way you plan them? And I will have to be honest and tell you, no, the vehicle's going to tell you 
as you start working on it, what you are and are not going to do. I remember so many times thinking, I got all the room in the world to, you know, do this. And you get to that point and it's like, there's no room for wires. Now what do we do? So you've got to be ready to adapt on the fly and, and things just happen. So, but you know, in the end, it all works out. So here's that pot, and it, it almost looks like, you know, kind of the backside of the SR-71 or, you know, one of the B-2, B-1 or B-2 bombers, you know, with the jet engines. And um, that, once again, completely custom panel, all built to hold the speakers and to hold the controls. Once again, it's got the vintage air controls there in the bottom. Just really a lot of fun, really neat vehicle. And here's some more of the wiring. Now you see the seats in place. Uh, what do you guys see in the background? Uh, yep, that's the, the truck we just talked about. So yeah, these were going on at the same time. So it was a kind of a crazy chaotic shop, but we always had a lot of fun doing these. A lot of hours involved, but you know, we got good people and good friends working on them. It makes it so much easier. So I know Randy spent a long time building these enclosures. These enclosures for the original Solo X woofers that had a pair of original Solo X 12 inch woofers, and they were built basically behind the two front seats, two of the three front seats, I should say, and you'll see that in just a minute. Uh, so one seat right in the middle, flanking a 12-inch Solo X on each side. And there's the mock-up of the seat bases that we built into the seats, have them covered with foam and carved and, and shaped, and they're actually pretty comfortable. They're almost like little jump seats. They sit lower and kind of behind where the driver's seat is. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one of the early McLarens that kind of did that too, had one seat right in the middle, and I think they had two jump seats in them, but that wasn't the uh, inspiration. We just wanted to do something different, something that people hadn't seen before. Uh, now you see the enclosures getting closer to being built. I can't tell you how many pieces of wood and how much Bondo and fiberglass were used in those, but there was a ton of work in that. And you start to see the metal framework, which is going to house the, uh, the three quarter inch plexiglass over the engine. So you can see the engine. So once again, you know, even though it's an audio vehicle, we will make sure that, you know, all that work is shown. Started working on the bed. We ended up putting a fuel safe racing fuel cell in it. Uh, had to have gas tank somewhere, and we kind of took place of that when we put the rear end in place. It was a lot bigger than the factory rear end. So this is sunk about four inches into the floor, but it also protrudes four inches above the floor. And then you can see that five gallon uh, uh, Ride Tech uh, air suspension system set up and ready to go. And you see the, uh, the Ride Tech uh, solenoids right here for the, the raising lower and dual air compressors and of course the power supply to plug it into the wall so you don't have to drag one with you just plug it in with an extension cord from underneath the vehicle so that worked out pretty cool now we're going to start framing the back side of the cab around the engine and we got to figure out what to do with all those wires because uh, there really was no aftermarket wire harness uh, we had the entire wire harness for that 97 lincoln mark 8 uh, pulled out that we used, basically used the same motor as that, that Cobra did. So uh, we had to, we spent probably a week or two just taking out the wires we didn't need. I mean, every single power window, power mirror switch, heater controls, every single wire uh, was pulled out of the donor vehicle just in case we needed or wanted it. So we paired that back, uh, seeing what we were going to do with it. Started building the system for the rear, thought, hey, we're going to do all this cool stuff in the bed. Let's make sure that people can listen to music from the back of the vehicle because normally in a lot of these vehicles, you would open up the doors and with the doors facing, you know, backwards, you get speakers in the doors, you get sound out the back. Well, we, of course, screwed that up when we suicided the doors. So no longer did we have sound out the back. So real quickly, we made this nice little pod for a clarion monitor and two of the six and a half inch SS speakers. Now you see the bed starting to take place. You see the fuel cell. We actually took that fuel safe fuel cell and we upholstered the top of it to make it blend in with the vehicle. And then of course there's that five gallon air tank and your, your quad capacitors. And you start to see that the wires run for the amplifiers and the speakers and you have a lot of wiring in this vehicle. As you guys know, the more amplifiers you get just keeps compounding the complexity. So there's the start of the amplifiers. Every one of the amplifiers was mounted on three quarter inch plexiglass, cut at 45 degrees, and then frosted on the edge. And you probably haven't seen it yet, but we removed the fuel filler from the back of the vehicle. So the whole concern was, well, 
what are we going to do to put fuel in it? So believe it or not, there is the fuel filler. And it, it, it's almost like a bathroom sink in kind of a way. It had a nice, you know, three inch clear tube that went down to that fuel cell. And we put the clear tube in there just so we could see when it was getting full so we didn't overfill it. But there's actually a drain in there too that if it did overfill would drain it out through the bottom of the vehicle like your current vehicles do. So here again, you know, had to consider all aspects of this vehicle. And you see the uh, air ride, the, the solenoids back there. I think those were actually for the air pressure gauges. But one thing that was really unique about this vehicle, and you always worry about, you know, drive shaft lengths. Everybody said, you know, you know, how did you make a custom drive shaft? Well, there is no drive shaft. This is the, the tail shaft of the transmission, and this is the input of the rear. They literally bolted together, and we didn't plan on that. That was one of those things that just happened by chance. So there is no drive shaft in this vehicle. It's transmission coupled directly to the rear end, uh, almost like you know a rear engine car, like a, uh, a Corvair or you know one of you know a Porsche or something like that. So it just kind of worked out. Here we're getting closer, getting the thing done. You see another angle of the fuel filler and the caps and the amplifiers going in place. See a lot of gray and white wires. Those are going to be for the LEDs. And this is long before we had LED controllers. This little circuit board was built by Jerry McCord that you saw in that picture, our amplifier engineer. This entire circuit he built and designed from scratch that would just flash the lights in, in different sequences. You know, flash the LED lights. That was custom built. We built four of these boards, put one together, and I really wish I knew what happened to the other ones. It'd be kind of cool to find those things again. In fact, I might have them in a box somewhere. I don't know. But here's that panel for the rear speakers with the two six and a halves, and I think that was a 11 or 14 inch Clarion monitor. And now you see everything's getting painted. Uh, once again, no vinyl involved. Uh, getting a few more amplifiers. I believe these were the SX 400.2s, and then here and here were the uh, KX 2500.1, so there were two of those on each of those Solo X12s. So even back then we were doing 5,000 watts of power on those two Solo X subs and, and that thing absolutely pounded. Uh, I had the, the covers off on the amplifiers being painted to match the vehicle once again and we had the end caps, which you can see here a little bit better, those were actually sent off to be chrome plated. And that took several weeks to get that done. So all these little details come together. And this is what you end up with when it's all put together. The tonneau cover, we took three separate tonneau co covers from this company, and I can't remember their name. And we basically built these two half tonneau covers out of those three pieces almost completely from scratch. Uh, we had to, you know, build these corners. We had to, you know, cut them down and make a trim around them and, and hinges. So... Yeah, there was a whole lot of extra planning work that went into it. There you see your four Optima batteries back in the corner and the fusing and wire. That was about the time we first came out with our own power wire and fuses, so that was a nice way to show it off. And it's really hard to see, but if you look right here, those are LEDs that were recessed into the one-inch solid copper bus bars. So the positive rail had blue LEDs and the negative rail, I uh, forgot what color we used on that, or maybe we did blue for the negative, red for the positive, but yeah, those uh, bus bars had LEDs recessed into those, and in fact, the LEDs were mounted from behind, so they're drilled all the way through. It was really kind of cool uh, the way we ended up doing that, and then, of course, that nice little cover to make sure, you know, everything's right on line, so, you know, if it did get wet, nothing would happen. You see the sponsor board when you do vehicles like this and these companies donate, you know, products and, you know, time and help. We always like to make sure we give them credit. So you see a big list of sponsors on this vehicle. And then there's your, your air ride controller that was right at your fingertips on your left hand, mounted between the center seat and the left jump seat. So... Here's the vehicle. This was its second SEMA show. The first one, we actually did not put the tonneau covers on it so people could see a little bit better. But here's a view of that vehicle all finished at SEMA. I cannot remember what year that was. Uh, there's the inside. Once again, all painted to match. Gorgeous paint on this thing. That blue just absolutely sparkles, with, especially with the, the white with the pearl in it. There's the overhead shot of the Clarion source units and the three SX amplifiers and the KQ30s. Um, if you notice that, that seat no longer has a headrest, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it was very exciting. I'm short, so I was one of the few people that could actually get in and drive this truck without hitting my head on anything. And I did, uh, fortunately, uh, drove this truck a couple laps around a racetrack. Not full speed, but parade laps, but it was still kind of fun driving this thing around, sitting on top of the front wheels. That's a really weird experience. There you see a great shot of the interior with the three seats and the, the original Soto X-12s. And then, of course, here's the vehicle. And this is the first time it was at SEMA. You can see that there is no bed cover on it. And that thing absolutely was gorgeous. Now, Wheel of Antiques made these wheels. This is the 16-inch version, which they made and which were readily available. And these are 18-inch that they custom built for us to match the front, just for the look of the vehicle. So I mean, you get a cool project. You know, the companies a lot of times like to get involved. So great looking vehicle, whole lot of fun. And then you see Eric's logo from Wicked Racing down in the corner. Um, give him credit for that paint job. But what a gorgeous vehicle. And this vehicle is in our museum. So if you guys wanted to come down and see it, uh, feel free. Uh, museums open 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Uh, I'd say pretty much seven days a week. The only time it's not open is holidays when we're closed. So we've got a great staff up there. Uh, a couple great receptionists that'll show you around and give you a tour of the Wall of Boom. So, anybody have any questions on the Econoline while we set up for the third and final vehicle? I'm going to keep going here, see if I can get out of this. Scott Williams says, isn't the dash staggered with 6.5s and 5 and a quarters? Nope, they were all the same size drivers. Uh, in fact, I if I can go back and find the pictures... Those are the same size, so they're actually staggered one in front of the other one by about an inch, and they're actually tilted towards the driver, so they almost look like different sizes, but they were actual size. Yeah, there you go, Ernie, if you can pull that picture up. So they were exactly the same size drivers. It's just the look of this picture kind of gives you that illusion that they were different sizes. But great question. Uh, we always try to use the, the six and a halves or six and three quarters when we can. What else we got for questions there, J. Dimmon? Were the 2500.1s Class Ds? Um, not back then. They were still Class A, if I remember it. God, that's been a long time ago. That's why they were so large. Um, they might have been Class D. That, that... Yeah, Ern Ernie's telling me that he remembers that they were Class D amplifiers. So, um, But great amplifiers. And those amplifiers were strappable, by the way. And we talked about bridging and strapping. Uh, strapping means you take two amplifiers and put them on one voice coil. Bridging means you take two channels and one amplifier and put them together to drive to a voice coil. But those, those 2500s were strappable for a 5,000 watt single channel amplifier. So, great question. So, uh, what else we got there? JW. Ashy says, was the 98 Cobra R engine a 4.6 or a 5.4? That was the 5.4, which was, uh, it was a great engine. In fact, I. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we wanted to dyno the vehicle, and we never got it dynoed to see what it actually did. But that was a brand new Cobra R motor, and it was a lot of fun. So great question, Ashy, and hope you're doing well. So what else we got? Any more questions before we jump on? We're getting to about 8.30 on the time zone, about ready to uh, draw some winners for some prizes after we go through the last vehicle. Uh, last question. So, do y'all have a set budget for the kicker show cars? Uh, the answer to that is yes, we do, and no, we don't always adhere to it. <laughs> Sometimes things just happen. I remember the first vehicle I worked on, which was a 55-panel delivery vehicle. Um, I didn't find out till a year later that uh, what we did to the vehicle was about four times the budget we planned for it. Nobody told me there was a budget. They said, hey, there's the car. Put as much equipment as you can in it and get it done by SEMA. So I did, and then I found out, like, a long time later, yeah, you really blew the budget on that one. It's like, well, no one told me, so how was I supposed to know? So while we try to have a budget, sometimes we, we just have a goal in mind, and you, know, and you really got to make a statement. So not always does it work out the way the budgets plan, unfortunately. Uh, the bean counters don't like to hear that in the accounting department, but hey, that's just the way it is. Things cost money when you want to do them right. So great. So if we have no more questions on the Econoline, kind of we're going to move on to the... I've ah, got one more. <coughs> Excuse me, Corbin. John, which one is your favorite car in the museum? Um, you know, right now, it's, that's tough. I mean, it's between this one and you know, the Econoline kind of and the one we're going to show next. But uh, another vehicle that I really liked, which we no longer have in the museum, was the uh, SRT6 we did. 
And that also had a uh, Solo X woofer in it and SX amplifiers, but that was another fun vehicle to build. That was the last vehicle I built when I was in the install bay before I transferred 100% over to the training department. So I can do this for you guys. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's hard to say. They're like children. It's hard to say, you know, who's your you know, favorite child. There's so much work. Uh, I can guarantee you I've left, you know, blood DNA in every one of those vehicles, and it's probably still there. So uh, hopefully forensics doesn't have to uh, do any murder investigations because they're going to find probably my blood because when you do stuff like that, you get cut. There's a lot of raw metal there. So great question. I, I wish I had an answer, but, you know, I don't know. I, you know, between that, it's it's tough. Uh, the Metro is so clean and just elegant, but the Econoline's so over the top, so it, it, they're really not on the same page. So, speaking of Metros, uh, let's cut to the Metro. <coughs> this is one of the other vehicles you'll see in the museum, and no, guess what? It doesn't look like that anymore. This is back when we had our original... Uh, four-car bay up on the hill, uh, 5021 Perkins Road. This car uh, was really interesting. We never really planned on this vehicle being a show vehicle. So once again, things just have a way of working out. Um, this vehicle was purchased and still owned 100% by, by Steve Irby. Bought it out of his pocket. He wanted this car. Um, a, a neighbor, you know, down the street from him had this vehicle, and Steve really wanted to buy this car, and the gentleman wouldn't sell it to him. Uh, so Steve kept pestering him, and after quite a while, he ended up being able to buy the vehicle. And this is, I think, the day that we brought it to the plant. It wasn't running, and, it, you know, it was a nice-looking you know, little vehicle, very original. But it didn't run, and, and Steve had a couple goals for it. Uh, he wanted, you know, to do some things to it, but we were pretty busy doing a bunch of the other vehicles. So... We not only pushed this thing around in the warehouse, uh, I, I hear rumors that they would actually pick it up with the forklift and set it in the pallet racks when it was in the way because uh, it wasn't running. But it was, you know, a couple of years after Steve got the vehicle that we had another car builder that was coming by that we were, you know, putting some final touches on an install that was going to SEMA. And Steve talked to him and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, getting some work done on this car. I think Steve's requirements were is he wanted air conditioning, uh, wanted wheels and tires, a nice paint job, a nice interior. So that was the th basic four qualifications, and it kind of got out of control and ended up what it is now, which is not a bad thing. So when we got the vehicle back from the car builder, uh, we're going to just jump right in with the interior. Um, Everything in this car was done in metal. Uh, the center console, that little pod there for the uh, the Nakamichi, that's, that was actually Nakamichi CD 700 CD player. Uh, everything was done in metal in the car, but nothing audio-wise was done, but the whole car was finished. So we had to look at this car and figure out, it is such a tiny car, how much audio can we put in it and where are we going to put it? And if you notice this door over here, um, there is literally no depth this this uh framework for the window regulator is pretty much flush with the front of the door so that was a real challenge we had to overcome no room in the kick panels for speakers we really could cut into the doors but how are we going to put a nice sounding system in this car so once again the vehicle will talk to you and it's going to tell you what you need to do so as i make this picture larger that's the, the slate we had to start with, just a pretty much blank door panel. Uh, very nicely done vehicle. I mean, it's a really cute little car. And it really is comfortable to drive. I really actually kind of like driving it. Not that I've driven it a lot. Um, unfortunately, um, I've driven this car more than Steve has. I think I've put 40 miles on this car of the 106 it has in parades and, you know, going to shows and whatnot. And it just, it, it's a shame because it, it's such a neat little car. It's so much fun to drive, but you really don't want to drive it because it, it's so special. But so that's what we had to work with for the interior. Where are we going to put door speakers in this thing? So I got the idea that why don't we go ahead and build the door panel pods? We're going to have to build them out on the doors. But we've got a problem uh, with room once again two seats in this car and they are really tight. I mean, you pretty much like feed yourself into this car. There really wasn't room for a lot of airspace. And we know that when you put a, a speaker in a, a door or anywhere, they've got to have some type of airspace to allow them to move. 
So these door panels started out as a quarter inch aluminum backplate and then we, we made this little shape in the, the top of the door and angled the speakers in a little bit to give them some character. And I'm going to tell you where this shape came from and why here in just a minute. But that's where we ended up deciding to put the front speakers. We had to build them onto the doors because there was absolutely no way we could build them into the door at all. So there's a look of the door finished. Now where that shape came from, if you see anything else in the picture that looks like that, yeah, the door handle. So as I always tell people, blend things together. Uh, everything should tie together. You should use the same material on the, in the trunk as on the inside of the vehicle so it doesn't look like a whole separate entity. So the little build out here was to give some airspace for the speakers so you had decent mid bass, but you couldn't build it too big because once again, you've got the seat and the way this worked out by doing that shape, this actually fits right over the bolster of the seat, so it allows the door to close, but we still have some airspace, and it almost works like an armrest. So it worked out kind of cool, and didn't plan on that. That's just kind of the way it worked out. So, <coughs> excuse me here again. Sometimes it just works great. Here's the way the trunk looked when we got it. Obviously, no audio done, nothing finished in the trunk, and yes, that is the battery. It is right behind the driver under the floor. So that presented another challenge and, and still to this day presents challenge if we ever have to replace that battery. It's a little bit of work. Um, here's another picture where you can see the battery on the inside. <coughs> that subwoofer enclosure had pretty much be built in pieces and put into the car in pieces. Uh, we set it up for two L710s. So those are basically the L7S10s, the cast basket. Uh, sealed enclosure. We didn't have a big car, so we didn't need to do a huge vented enclosure. We, we wanted to build this car really for sound quality. So as we go to the next picture, here's the box. It's all painted. You see the subwoofers in place. And if you look closely, you see that same shape that we had on the door handle and that we put in the, uh, the armrest area. So we carried that shape into the back. And then we're going to put some other chrome accents, which you'll see in just a minute. But the thing is, I've, I've always told people, you know, you want good wire, you want to do the wiring nice, but I still don't want to see any copper wire or plastic wire. So you got speakers with the, the magnets visible. How are you going to do that? And um, we ended up doing it by taking quarter-inch copper tubing. That's actually copper plumbing. Having it bent, well, we bent it. It wasn't hard to bend with uh, the little tubing benders. We bent it to shape, cut it to shape, and we sent it off and had that copper chrome plated, and we fed the wires through that copper tubing. And it was a real challenge to put those woofers in that enclosure because there is no space. So as the woofer is being moved in, someone had to turn this, this elbow, and someone had to pull that wire through on the inside to take up the slack. So it was a little bit of a challenge just to mount the woofers in that enclosure. And once they're mounted, it's like, don't, don't you guys ever blow these because I don't ever want to have to take them out. And to this day, they still are the original woofers, and they still sound fantastic. So here's a picture of the finished product. I'm sorry that one's a little, little blurry, but you see that, that teardrop shape. This is the Metropolitan logo, which we had this little just accent piece put in the closure, and that is three-quarter inch acrylic that we built a form for and custom bent. Um, we heated that acrylic up at the plastic shop, took the form, we laid the, the plastic after it was warm and soft on it, put a couple moving blankets on it, and four of us laid on it for two hours till it cooled to shape. So it's, it's amazing what you do for your car audio systems. But the tail lights, when you'll see the pictures of that, they've got kind of the, the fluorescent diffusers, you know, the, the uh, diamond pattern. So this has actually got red LEDs in it, and we did mesh across here that kind of simulates that, that look of the taillights, and same thing with these little uh, teardrops. They've got red plastic with LEDs behind those, and of course the trunk's done with the same leather as the inside of the car. And then underneath this little accent piece is uh, red LEDs just to light up the enclosure. It really is a nice look. So hopefully you guys can come by and see this thing in the museum. So here's the amp rack, which as I mentioned, you know, the battery is a challenge. So if we need to replace the battery, we have to take every bit of that apart. And once again, there are no wires visible. I mean, this is half inch aluminum and there's no wires visible anywhere. Um, even if you look underneath, there's, we actually 
hollowed out channels in the aluminum uh, for the wires to run in so they could run down and then build plates and chrome plated the plates to go over the top of that. So no wires are visible anywhere. We took the SXRC, which is the control for the SX amplifiers, and we changed the display color to red to match uh, the rest of the vehicle, and we also changed the displays on the amplifiers to red. So just those little touches, you know, really make a vehicle stand out, make all the difference in the world. So here's a great view of the inside of the vehicle, uh, all finished and put together with the gauges lit up. Um, there's also a bar here underneath the radio that is 5 eighths half round steel that was chrome plated, so it matched, and let's go backwards, and it's a little hard to see because there's the same bar is run across here in the subwoofer enclosure. So those accents all tied together. Little 2.3 Ford engine. It's painted in 1928 metallic bronze. So nice little engine in there. It's not supercharged. It didn't really need a supercharge. That's pulled out of a, I think it was a, an 85 Ranger pickup from Ford. That was a, a donor engine. They, they pulled out of one of their demo vehicles. And... I always tell people the bottom of this car looks better than the top. It actually, it, I mean, the top is gorgeous. It's smooth, it's streamlined. But if you look underneath the car, you see the detail and work that were done under this car. Um, these long tubes that you see, that is one inch stainless steel that was bent and it's painted on the top, that, that 28 uh, Jaguar metallic bronze and the bottom is actually brushed and then clear coated. But you notice how the body rolls clear underneath the car. So that's why it's really not practical to drive it because the, the stones are going to come up and chip that. But the bottom of this thing is, is just gorgeous. The Flowmaster muffler had to be cut down. There wasn't enough room for the muffler into the car, so we had to shorten the muffler. And it still sounds really good. It's a great sounding car and, and runs great. In fact, there you can see that muffler, which has been shortened. Uh, you can see the, uh, the air ride system, the four link, just so much fun and so cool underneath, but most people don't get a chance to see underneath it. So there's a picture of the outside of the car, finally finished. Uh, the whole, you know, molding on the side was custom built. Those are Mercedes C-Class headlights. The bumper, the front grille, everything was custom made for this car and all made out of steel. So whole lot of work. So I actually kind of ended up almost on time tonight. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that little tour through the vehicles. Uh, it, you know, and personal on my behalf, it was such an honor to be a part of all those three vehicles in one form or another. But uh, it, it takes a team to do these, and you know, you got to have a lot of good people. And we've always had great installers, and we still got, you know, three guys back there that just continue to put out amazing work. And you got Tim, Chase, and Josh back there just doing really cool things. Occasionally, we get Jeremy back there. We get JW back there doing a few things to help us out when he's not doing events. So uh, great vehicles, a lot of fun. And anybody got any questions on the Metro, the Chevy, or the uh, Econoline if, before we uh, finish this up and give some things away? Can the Econoline pop a wheelie? Can the Econoline pop a wheelie? Um, you know, we never tried, but no, I don't think it will. So uh, no more questions? All right, I think we got uh, some, some viewer questions that were sent in online. And of course, we got the fails. We don't need to go through the installs because we already did a whole show on installs. So uh, let's start with the, the reader's questions of the two weeks. Uh, so is there a way I can run a two-way, that set of two-way speakers and a subwoofer on the same two-channel amplifier? Uh, very interesting question. And since you know most people are running you know, three channels, four channels, or, or five channels, there is a way you can run a set of coax or components and a subwoofer off one amplifier, and it's done with passive crossovers. So first of all, with the new amplifiers, their, their amplifier has to be bridgeable to do this. So you connect the coaxes, just like you would normally, to the left and right channels, and the woofer is going to connect the way you would normally bridge the amplifier, which on all the kicker amplifiers from day one has been the left positive and the right negative. So that's the outer terminal. So the four terminals, you use the outer two to bridge it. So you got your speakers connected you know, to the two channels and then the subwoofer is bridged across the two. And by using passive crossovers to limit the frequencies going to each of the drivers, even if the amplifier is only four ohm stable, you can still run a four ohm subwoofer and four ohm components. 
So, and if they're two ohm stable, you could run two ohm components in a two ohm woofer. People think, well, isn't that going to make it one ohm? It's really not. What happens is those passive crossovers increase the impedance that those drivers get above their operating range. So on the woofer, as you get higher in frequency, the impedance increases, and on the, the tweeters or the mid-ranges, it actually gets uh, higher impedance on the lower frequencies. So that's how you can get by with running the amplifier at its minimum impedance with, connected in what we call the three-channel mode. So yeah, great question. So it is possible to do that. You just don't see a lot of people using passive subwoofer crossovers because that's a pretty big coil wire, but it does work. So second question, can I use a key 200.4 amplifier with my Bose stock audio system? And the answer to that is yes. Um, even without you know, interfaces on a lot of these newer vehicles, you can take the output right out of the Bose radio and feed right into the key amplifier. Now the key's got a radio detect switch. If you've got, a, say, one of the Chrysler or the Ford radios that needs a load on it, that key does have 65 ohm loads built in. Um, something else I learned with that key amplifier, that was on a Subaru, and I suppose it's true on the OnStar vehicles. If you take the speaker outputs that normally went to the door speaker or you know, the rear speaker and you run them to the input of the amplifier, the amplifier doesn't load that factory radio or factory amplifier down. It, it actually presents it with about 10,000 ohms of impedance where the speaker is generally four. So that's 2,500 times difference in impedance. So by having those 65 ohm resistors, we can trick that factory amplifier radio into thinking it has a speaker connected to it when it really doesn't. So yes, you can take the output of your Bose radio and you can run it right into the RCA inputs of the key amplifier as long as the frequency range is acceptable for what you're trying to play out of those speakers. So another great question. If you have questions and we haven't answered them here, just remember you can always send them to support at kicker.com. We got four guys upstairs that answer those questions in the phone calls or you can call us eight to five you know, central time, Monday through Friday, and they'll be happy to talk to you on the phone. But we got some great tech guys that can walk you through just about any scenario or any problem you might have. So last question. Why do some of the things I listen to sound so different on my stereo system? So I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about. Is he talking about, you know, the recording quality? Because we, we've done a show, in fact, we might want to do it again, on the different types of recording, you know, how the sound engineers have a lot of control over how things sound, you know, when they're recorded. But another possibility could be the source that you're using. Are you using the radio, AM or FM? Or you using DAB, digital audio broadcast? Are you using MP3? Are you using USB? Are you Bluetooth? Are you using satellite radio? All those have different frequency response ranges, different signal to noise. So if you switch from one source to the other, you are definitely going to know a difference in sound. But once again, it all depends on the recording quality of what the engineer put together when he mixed that, that particular song. So great questions, and once again, if you have any, go ahead and uh, send them to support at kicker.com or call 1-800-256-0808 Monday through Friday from 8 to 5 Central Time. The guys will be happy to help you out. So now comes kind of my fun time. Now we're going to go to fails. Now, not all of these are completely car audio fails. I mean, how many times can you see really bad wiring jobs in a dash or in the trunk? I mean, there's so many out there. I mean, we could just pretty much bore you with them. But since this has to do with electricity, I thought it kind of fit. How many problems can you see with this picture? Ernie, what do you see back there? Or Bill or, or Jeremy? Yeah, I, we're talking water and electricity do not mix. Uh, so first of all, you've got looks like a bundle of extension cord here. Uh, this is a power strip, folks. Now, what you may or may not have realized by this power strip, if you look at the shape of that plug, that is a round plug. Since it's a round plug, that tells me that's 220 volts. That's European. So now they're really asking for more trouble, and, and it's being supported by, yep, you guessed it, uh, two flip-flops. So any strong wave is probably going to send these guys. Um, we might as well say it. Uh, yes, alcohol was involved in these poor decisions. So yeah, probably not the smartest thing to do. But you know, sometimes when you're drinking, you don't always make the smartest decisions. So definitely a fail, or as I like to say, stupid human tricks. 
Um, here's another great one, actually another pair of great ones. These actually came together when I found them. Uh, so if you're really having troubles cooling your amplifiers because you've got you know too low of impedance or too much power, here's a great thing to do. Go ahead and get a home AC unit, uh, spray foam it into the side window of your van, and get a little you know portable generator and put it on a luggage rack in the back. And I, I, I'm not sure if that's a load of peaches next to it, like he's taking his lunch with him, but not great. And, and hey, if your headlight goes out, and yeah, just get a bunch of LED flashlights and strap them into place. That's going to work for a headlight. So definitely some automotive fails there. And, you know, we could almost say that the, the van here could be an audio fail if the, they really were trying to just cool their amplifiers. Because you've seen these guys at these SBL events with, with these huge, you know, really loud, powerful marine fans. But, hey, true air conditioning, I think that's even going to work better. All right. Ernie sent me this one earlier. Um, I, I can see this now. Yep, I, I can see the complaint now. Customer comes back, my subs are rattling. I think my subs are blown. Um, no, you're an idiot, sir. <laughs> All those empty cans are what are rattling. And it's probably infinite baffle, too. So you know, he's got the you know, cans rubbing right up against the cones of the speakers. Like, yeah, you guys did a poor job on my install. Now my speakers are blown. No, you're an idiot, once again. You definitely not fail, and you deserve to be under stupid human tricks in the fail section. So last one. Um, you know, when you blow a speaker, you can hear that usually, and you just keep playing it. It's not going to make it sound any better. Uh, yeah, this thing apparently had been playing for a very long time with a ruptured cone. Um, it wasn't just hit once and cracked. I mean, you can definitely see it's all disformed on the edges where it's been rubbing together. And Yeah, so... Definitely fail there. Uh, guys, you, you know when your system doesn't sound good, it's time to pull those speakers out and put some in that do sound good. So hopefully you never have to do that. With that, we're going to conclude the fail section of the evening. <clears throat> I think uh, you guys are all waiting to see who's going to win tonight's prizes. And I'm kind of waiting too because I don't know. But I bet you Bill has got some winners that he's going to pop up on screen. Remember, if we call your name, watch for an email from Bill. He's going to ask for your name, your actual shipping address, not a P.O. box, and your phone number. And don't forget to include your shirt size because, yes, we are sending you guys T-shirts as well. So uh, tonight's third place winner is going to be Bill or the uh, second runner up, as we like to call it, is Marco R. from Texas. Marco R., congratulations for winning the... Uh, the uh, kicker tumbler, you're going to win the uh, unmasked t-shirt and the unmasked koozie. And, you know, Texas is not that far away, like I keep saying. If you want, come on up here to Oklahoma and come see these vehicles in our museum and come take a tour of the plant. We'd be happy to have you up here Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. So congratulations, Marco R. from Texas. The first runner-up or second place winner is going to be Bill. Um, Nathan W. from Stillwater. Nathan, that's awesome. Nathaniel. Uh, w from Stillwater, say, so you're real close. You have no excuse for not coming to claim your prize. So uh, come on up to the, the museum. Uh, the girls up front uh, will be happy to help you out. They will uh, fix you up. And like I say, we got some great things for you. See, if you've never been here, if you're from Stillwater and watch the show, chances are you've probably been here. But now you have an excuse. So grand prize winner and to finish it up for the night is going to be Mr. Billiam Billfrog, Bradley K. from Indiana. So, Bradley, you're going to win the BF100, the wireless Bluetooth Bullfrog speaker. You're going to get the Kicker Unmasked T-shirt and the Kicker Koozie. So, before we sign off, do we have any final questions, JW, that we want to pop up here and answer? You know, or we, uh, we got everything pretty much answered. I see 25 Hertz to Life up there, and, of course, Ashy's up there. Clint, I saw you asking some questions. And Living Loud with Andy, don't forget that tonight. Don't forget to tune in for his show. He always has a great after show. And, has a lot of fun, and like I say, I, I enjoy watching Andy's show, and it was fun to be on his show the time I was. So, great show. So, if you're, you're not done, you're not burnt out on car audio yet, hang around for his show. That's Living Loud with Andy coming up uh, not long after we end this show. So, I don't see more questions popping up on my board over here.